one of the sets of data that got everyone very excited at the recent ASCO conference was the data of these new immune antibodies, which basically, uh, until about really sort of five years ago, people didn't really believe that you could pharmacologically intervene to uh, manipulate the patient's own immune system in a meaningful way against their tumor. And the latest data suggests that there are ways to do that in, in quite some striking ways. And so if we take a disease such as melanoma, a disease which you know, was almost, for late stage patients, well, there was really a, a, a very poor outcome for those patients with very few therapeutic options. At the recent conference that we saw, we saw data presented from a number of companies which suggests that these antibodies, if you can do combinations of them, about 20% of those patients have a so-called complete response where all of their detectable tumor disappears and it looks quite durable, that response. So that's a really remarkable outcome, but it's only 20% of the patients and the cost of those two antibodies is $300,000. And so that, the question is, you know, is that sustainable in the healthcare system? Probably not. So I think the yeah. thing that, that we're certainly very interested in from an investment perspective is uh, the so-called circulating tumor DNA, which is it's quite clear that now some cancers release the contents of, of their cell into the circulating system, into your blood. And actually that rather than having to take a biopsy of a patient, you can detect some of the molecular changes that are going on in those cancers purely from a simple blood draw. Technically, there's a lot of interest in that. And actually, if I, if I, at the ASCO conference, I think that the two things that were really creating the buzz were immuno-oncology and circulating tumor DNA. I think there's a huge amount of, I would say, again, duplication in the system. So uh, Martin spoke about immunotherapy, this ASCO. So they were two or three drugs which are forefront, which are going to make it. But if you actually look at the landscape, there are 15 such compounds by pharma, biotech, which are going through the system now. And you know only one or two of them, or maybe three, will get licensed. So why are we bothering to do the other 15? You know? And you know, if you go back to the laboratories and look at the discoveries that are taking place, these huge banks of data on crystal structures and chemistry, which is just, and it has to be patented, and I don't know what the right answer is, but we're actually doing the same amount of work about 15 times over while there's only one registrable drug. And yet the system says, well, we're, it's expensive because so many are failing. Well, they're going to fail because somebody's going to win the race. And I'm not saying that you should stop people from starting the race, but I think halfway through, if there's one or two clear winners, it's actually not worth it. And I think the cost of drugs, as Nas says, is, I find it as a treating physician, it's just not going to be sustainable anywhere. And it's, the bubble is going to burst. And we've been saying that for five years. You folks are better at predicting when it's going to burst, but it's going to burst. But do you think it could be more coordinated? So you, there's enough cancers to go around. There's enough things to, you know, people to be treated. You know, 14 million people get cancer mm. a year. But science, sadly, but like most things, is quite fashion-driven. So, you know, everyone's now on immunocology, and then they'll sort of go to something else. But if there was a more coordinated approach, and one could divide up the cancers, maybe, or divide it up, am I just living in sort of cloud cuckoo land? But um, it, it, it isn't, it, it feels very inefficient to me. No, I completely agree. And I think, I'm not a patent lawyer, but, you know, I think our, you can't, in a utopian world, you know, you've got one big body which says, you do this, and you do that, and that will kill innovation, and innovation has to be rewarded. But I think there is a middle ground. I think repetition is certainly a very inefficient way of doing it. So I think there are some aspects of um, cancer care which are changing, which are in fact very affordable. So, uh, and the technology is allowing us to do more for more patients faster and cheaper. So one of the things that, one of the areas I work on are in, are on the BRCA genes. Most people have heard of the BRCA genes now because Angelina Jolie had a, a, a mutation in one of those genes. And it was one of the genes that were, was found at, the, um, at our institute. Um, and for a long time, that was actually, it was found 20 years ago, but for a long time, because it was very expensive to do this reading of the gene and, and all of the infrastructure, we couldn't help that many people. 
But now we can, we can do that fast, we can do it quickly. So over the last couple of years, the mainstreaming program that I've been running, we've now rolled that out to all ovarian cancer patients in our institution, and now we're doing that for the whole of the NHS. And we've been able to get four times the throughput at a quarter of the cost, and we've taken that time of getting that test down from 20 weeks to four weeks with no new resources, because that's, that's where. Now, in some ways, it's not a new drug, but it's just using the new technologies and all of our new insights to think, actually, we can make all this stuff now work much better, much faster, and much cheaper. So that's a great side of the story. I think there's a whole um, era now of sort of, um, sort of patient participation in their own health. And the way we really need to do that is to be able to get information from the people with cancer longitudinally. And these sorts of, over many years, and these sorts of experiments used to be unfeasibly expensive and unfeasibly complicated to be able to organize. But now with people with their smartphones, with the sort of apps that sort of people like Apple and Google are sort of making out and people just logging their own information, making it available. When Apple made this um, app called ResearchGate available a few weeks ago, and within about six hours, 20,000 people had um, logged on. They had one study on Parkinson's. They've already got the largest study on Parkinson's from people wanting to do it. So I, I, I think that that sort of having the crowd, having the people coming back in and feeding into that is going to make absolutely revolutionize how we're going to be able to treat and manage cancer.